Today we're going to talk about fine steel machines. Hopefully, I'm going to keep it up after the Kathleen talk, which was super funny, but anyway, I, I love it. <laughs> uh, but we're going to go deep into something that it's complex, but I think I managed to get it more or less simple, easy. I don't know. How many of you know what a fine steel machine is? Can you raise your hands? Okay. How many of you use a fine testing machine in production? Oh. One, two, three, four. Not that bad, not that bad. Uh, probably most of you hear about fine testing machines at, the, at college, right, at the university. Like, you know, there is this, well, lessons about uh, like, like math and so on, where you study that fine testing machines are really useful for logics and the kind of stuff, boring and useless. Uh, so we're going to try to understand how we can benefit from fancy machines nowadays with the current technology for the front end. But before, you see there is this background image. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to give you like some clues to understand what it is. And let's see if someone in the audience knows what's the picture at the end of the talk. Uh, so my name is Ruben Sospedra. I'm a JavaScript hacker, whatever. I'm an independent contractor, so if you need a hand, you know. Uh, I am from Barcelona, Catalonia, and my background is actually pol uh, political science. So I'm Catalan, I say political science, I'm Scotland. If you want to have an interesting <laughs> conversation, yes, uh, ping me after the talk. We can have a beer or whatever you're doing here. And another interesting thing, completely unrelated with the talk, is that this is a capybara, it's my favorite animal, it's uh, the biggest rodent in the world. It's amazing. As you can see, it's freely shaped. This is like a rat, actually, but like a rat mixed with a dog. So it's really cool. <laughs> the other problem is that uh, they live mostly in Venezuela, and Venezuelan people eat them. Oh. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, you know, the, the developed use of interface, interfaces is not easy. This is something that David Kurshit said in the Real Rally in 2017, which was kind of the beginning of these fine testing machines coming back to the front end wall. And uh, I think this, is, this quote is probably the most important because it's actually super complex. There is a history of the front end where it wasn't that difficult at the beginning. Uh, probably the dinosaurs, the developer dinosaurs in the audience remember when uh, everything was static, uh, HTML, CSS, I like Kathleen said before. Uh, then we evolved maybe to, I don't know, rendering with tweak PHP, you know, handlebars, the kind of stuff that was super easy to reason about. All the logic was in the server, server was doing all the magic with models adapted, blah, 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 blah. And then we started doing the single page applications and shifting everything to the clients and then everything is suddenly super slow because everything is super large, etc. etc. This is not new for you, right? You know that it's complexity is getting bigger. That means that we have more bugs, more race conditions, and stuff like that in the front end. And usually the problem is that we expect that the user is going to follow our products and instructions. <laughs> so if we show something that is not proper, they will do in their own way, which is not good. Which cause, causes more bugs and so on and so on. We have also this one, which uh, I don't know if any of you thinks that if you press the cancel button, this is going to stop. This never stops. So the cancel button is only so you can relieve your stress and smash the button. <laughs> it's only for that. This is a race condition, actually, but it's not against the network, it's against the disk. That's what's happening. Or this one, which I hate. I, 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 this is something that disturbs me a lot, but not especially, this is like when you go to write like, I don't know, a newspaper or something and then the ad pops in. But what I really hate is if you use an Android device, when you want to share something, and then you click share, and then appears this bottom banner with the different applications, but suddenly another banner pops in, which the direct message like for Telegram, WhatsApp, or Twitter. So if you miss at that moment, you can send a compromised link to someone that you don't want to. And this actually happened to me, and then you have to explain to your girlfriend what's that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem, you see? And why is that? Because we do all the time defensive programming. This is the first key concept. Defensive programming is basically when you're in that situation that you are coding something, then a bug or a problem, an issue, whatever appears, and then you go straight and fix the problem. You don't think about the big, the big picture. You don't reason about what you're doing. You just go and fix it. And then you start putting some if-elses. 
and the cyclomatic complexity goes bigger and bigger, that kind of problems. So I'm going to illustrate this with an example that I guess all of you have been in the, had been in this situation before. So we're doing a normal fetch request. We're fetching a user, right? We expect a promise, blah, blah, set the state, render the name at the end. But we don't want the user, if it's in a low bandwidth connection, to be waiting in a blank screen for, for any time, for, for long, whatever, right? So we also have a state for this loading, and then we render a loading. Meanwhile, the request is going on. If we are making requests, maybe something is broken. So we have to catch the different errors that may appear, right? We can have an error while fetching, we can have an error while parsing a JSON, and then if an error happens, we have to display it, not an error we have, we have to give context to our users. But our request usually takes a lot of time, so we need to provide the possibility to the user to cancel the request and do a different thing. So I don't know, if you pay attention to the code that I'm showing to you, it's basically shit, okay? <laughs> You've been there, probably, and you end up with this massive renders, uh, render functions, whatever, that it's really difficult to grasp in a single like look what's going on in there. And why is this happening, the definition programming, why is it happening? It's not because the architecture, right? We are not gonna change from, I don't know, we're not gonna move to a domain driven design and suddenly everything is gonna be fixed. Uh, it's not a te technology, so React is not here to fix that, neither, I don't know, BU, Angular, Circular, whatever it comes in the future. Neither the patterns, right? If we, this, this, this like everlasting fight between object oriented programming and functional programming, both are great. Just pick up one, stay consistent, but this is not gonna fix that. The problem is the approach. The problem is that we, you, we usually do bottom up approach, which is basically like the extension of philosophy, whatever, when, when you came from defensive programming. Bottom up has many problems, right? Um, but we're gonna list like the most important. First of all, it's difficult to understand the goal you are doing because you generate a lot of exceptions, cyclomatic complexity is big, there is a lot of edge cases, there is a lot of mutations, not local mutations, which could be good, but like general mutations, which is a problem. That means it's gonna be difficult to test, okay? Testing is complex because you don't understand it, as I mentioned, because it's hard to access. Maybe if you're doing some end-to-end -end testing, it's difficult to like select some nodes. It's not pure, so you execute the one function, the same function over and over, and there are diff different outcomes coming from that function. Uh, there is this massive complex uh, setups for testing. I've seen really, this is really true, as a contractor, I've seen test setups for Enzyme that are bigger than the project, actually, for React Native which is like, uh, no, this is wrong. This is like a cold smell, as big as the testing suite. So, uh, following, uh, enhancing your product is gonna be also very difficult. As you see, this is like, a, this is very obvious, right? It's difficult to understand, hence it's difficult to test. If something is difficult to test, and hence it's not only difficult, because everything we mentioned, but it's also very risky, because your test suite is not gonna be very good so you are not sure when you change something if you are breaking something else, right? Which means that you're gonna have even more bugs. Everything you, every time you fix something with this defensive approach, you're gonna generate a bug, but maybe in another place. And when it means you generate more bugs, what it means is that you generate more bugs, way a lot more bugs. And this is, I don't remember the data, that's why I didn't put it here, I couldn't find it, but probably, maybe you can help me. But there is this famous data that Many projects, they have a number of bugs that increases exponentially. Because you're fixing, you fix one bug, you generate five more. Then you fix one of those, and you, what well, those five, and then you have 25. Then you fix those 25, and then you have 100, whatever. So that's the problem with this kind of approaches. So at the end, you're basically this poor Charmander, like trying to fix bugs and fires all around, <laughs> right? You'll find this at the end, really quickly, these projects this, that are monoliths that no one wants to touch, probably in your company have one of those. So what's the solution? Solution is top-down approaches, which actually makes a lot of sense. Bottom up, top-down. Um, top-down basically is that when you have problems, new features, whatsoever, where you are 
how you're going to fix that problem. It's not by just going to that issue and then fix something in, I don't know, an hour, half an hour, push it to production. Instead, you're going to go back to your system, to your product, and reason about what's happening, why we have this error, how can we fix it, what are the other possible outcomes, what are the corner cases, what are the edge cases, blah, blah, blah. You know. So basically what you're doing is you stop reacting, pun intended, and, and, <laughs> and you start acting on your product. This is important. And until here, you basically notice that I study political science. So basically, how we do reflect a top-down approach in a product with that? What's that? A user diagram, a flow, as easy as it is. Most of, actually, this is something that's going to make super happy all of your designers. So in this example, it's not really relevant. It's just to give you the idea. This is a magazine or a blog whatsoever. But let's look at something that's important. It's like in this area here, like at the right, bottom right of the picture, you can see that there is like, uh, I think that's the contact form, whatever. The important thing is that there is two arrows pointing to that page. That means that by definition, your product, you can only get to that state by two different links. A third link, it's a bug. Even if no one, if that's not breaking your page, like it is not a problem for any user, user, but it's a bug because it's not designed on your product. That's an important thing. What's so powerful of that is that first, you are establishing a contract between uh, product and engineering teams. Because when it comes to the product owner and says, hey, hey, I want this thing, I want this thing, guys, you can say, okay, how this is translated to the diagram? Okay, is this thing here, here, here. Once this is agreed and approved, you know exactly what you gotta do. This is basically the best, uh, what's the name, product criteria that anyone can give you, right? And the second thing, and for me, is the most important. I always say that we developers, what we do is we translate human language to technical languages. So this is the human language, and the technical language is a fine steam machine. The easiest way to represent a diagram or a flow in technology, it's a fine steam machine. And what's a fine steam machine? Is that? Don't. Goodbye. No. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever. That, that's like a deterministic fancy machine. It's a key into pull, blah, blah, blah. Never start explaining anything to anyone saying it's a key into pull of anything. Really, it doesn't work because they're going to be staring at you like this, like, <laughs> shit, man, what's you, what you saying? <laughs> so basically, I, I had this problem at some point. I remember I didn't study computer science or nor engineering. So I went to a friend who's a math scientist, and he helped me to decipher it. And basically, we're going to explain what he explained to me step by step, like baby steps. So basically, sigma is the input al alphabet. This could be this in JavaScript. It's an object, right? Or an enum, whatever. It's easy, a dictionary, right? Uh, S is a finite, not empty set of states. So that's the easiest one. What's inside? inside of log or unlock isn't really relevant. This is going to be like your model, the model of your state. This is going to change depending on what you're doing. If you're doing banking or, I don't know, a chat or whatever. This is going to change. It is not relevant. The relevant is the other part. The relevant here now is also that it's finite and you have your states always defined. You have a sub-zero, obviously, so you have one first state, which is part of all these states. Makes sense. And then you have delta, uh, which is the transition function. Uh, this is also called transductor sometimes, whatever, but this could be a simple implementation. In this case, this machine is um, it's cyclic, and, si and one single time cyclic, something like that is the name. Well, basically that means that you don't need an action, that one state only has a next state, and it's cyclic. So you are moving through this, like a semaphore. It goes to green, to red, to yellow, to green, I think, right? And it's always like that, and it never stops, because if not, people dies, and that's bad. <laughs> okay, so other, any, any, anyhow, uh, the other way will be like you also accept an action, and depending on the action, on your state, you give a different state. But this is the idea, it's super easy, it's just two lines of code. So this is your fine system machine, that's it, that's, that's everything. That's a fine system machine. This is a turnstile, like in the underground, right? So we have log and unlock, there is only two options, it starts on lock because if not, the early bird in the morning is going to join for free on the underground. We don't want that. Everyone has to pay. 
and the transition at the end. This is, this is an object at the end. The first machine is only the first one, the, the, the machine thing. In JavaScript, it's an object, or in TypeScript, it could be a record, right? Or in C Sharp, it's a record, I think, also. In Python, it's a tuple. Uh, it's called a tuple. And in PHP, they call for help. So that's, <laughs> that's the, that's the frame the same machine. We don't need these weird definitions from math, whatever, or all the, all the original papers, which are like super old and super long and super difficult to digest. That's everything that we need to know. So now we know how it looks in the math concepts and in the abstracts. So let's give it a quick look how this is going to look in the engineering, engineering world. Uh, coming, going by to the first example that they showed you, the fetching a user. So this could be represented like, I have this initial state, which is idle, right? Usually in fancy machines, this, this dot means the black hole, means uh, the initial state. I have my states, the S, Right, idle, fetching, success, error, that's it, cool. And then I have my delta, my transitions. From either you wanna go to fetching, you go through fetch, yada yada, you understand it. That's it, that's, that's, that's basically how you're gonna represent it, right? This is a very easy and simple, and as you can imagine, not really for real world products, implementation of a fancy machine, well implementation, definition of a fancy machine. Fancy machine is way longer, but I don't have the time in a single talk to explain everything, but you have words, you have a state chart, which is the combination of different fine states machines. I'm gonna show you some uh, resources at the end and you can like keep digging. You can go into the rabbit hole. So um, I'm gonna do a demo, but before the demo, I have to explain to you what are the three key concepts of the fine state machine that you always have to keep in mind when you're working with them. First of all, it's a fantasy machine is deterministic. And probably you, all of you know what it does mean, but anyways, the deterministic is that it's predictable. So it's pure. If I have my fantasy machine, always if it's in the state uh, fetching, no, if it's in the state, sorry, evil, and I trigger the action fetching, fetch, sorry, I'm gonna go to, through fe to fetching. If I'm in fetching and I trigger the action success, I'm always gonna go to, to Fulfill and go to success, sorry. But you get the idea. So I can predict the next state of the machine always is the same progress, progression. It's always the same. Um, that's really important because uh, there are some benefits that we're gonna show you in the demo that are based on the deterministic part. Like for example, you can do automated generated tests or things like that. Since you can start your fine machine at any point, because it's predictable. The second one is it's an automata, which means that it's a predetermined sequence, like I mentioned, the, the semaphore, city lights, they always act in the same way, and they don't rely on external sources. The fantasy machine holds its own logics for transitions. They don't, have, they don't depend sort of on three parties. That, that's really important. And the last one, obviously, it's finite. Uh, this is also important because that's what makes possible that finds the machines to be a resourceful tool for us humans uh, to work to make products. Otherwise, we couldn't create these diagrams because we cannot hold infinite in our brains. And actually, those are different machines. They exist and they are for completely different purposes. Um, yeah, so basically, a fantasy machine is a pure system that can only be in one of a set of predefined states. This, this was me now, but not really, because I started doing this like one year ago, so I didn't change the quote, but, but it works. So, it's demo time. It's not as good as yours, but I think it's gonna work. So basically, what we have is a screen that you're not seeing anything, because I have to mirror this place. But now you can see something. Cool. So this is our product. Um, it's the same example, we're gonna fetch usernames. When it, we are in evil, we find new one, it's on fetching and it's not working because it's intended. So let's see the code. Basically this is our, you, you can see, like it's fine, shall I enlarge, bigger? More? More? Maybe you want to call me the first host. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think you put, you put pluses in the error there. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 
There you go. I need another hand. That's a problem. Yeah. Now. Oh, it was a joke. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, so wherever this is our machine, right? We have. So as I mentioned before, our machine could be just an object. Obviously, for production applications, I would recommend to use like XState or other libraries, which holds like most of the logics for you. Same way you are using React, you are not developing React for you, right? So this will be the same thing. But the important like key concept here to remember is that it's a definition, and objects are really good for definitions. So our machine has an initial state, which is evil. When I mean evil, my machine knows that on the action or event fetch, then the machine goes to fetching. This is an important thing. But what is going on right now is that I want to couple somehow my machine right, to React. This is something that's not explained. And this is the most important thing you have to remember today is what I'm going to explain now, which is called commands. So what I want is this. I want to connect. This action has to do something. right? which is fetching the user. And then the user knows how to move to fulfill or fail. So if I uncomment this, and by the way, I'm going to share the code later on so you can see what's going underneath. It's really easy. It's my own implementation, like in, in 30 lines of code, so you don't get bloated with a lot of stuff. But I think that when you see the other part of the code, it's going to be easier. But anyway, just for the proof of concept. Yes. That's what you have to prepare when you don't have your hands for typing. So if we find anyone, hopefully, yeah, Abigail Jacobs, Ethan Cho, and Wi-Fi failing. OK, Gonka, whatever, Felix. So we have a lot of names. One of the cool parts here is that, as you can see, when I'm, if I click like a lot of times, I cannot generate any, any error. Because when you're in the fetching state, there is no the possibility to do another fetch. There is no command on fetching to do fetch a user. This command is only accessible when you're an evil. So that's really important. For example, my machine, I could say that has a design flaw or something like that, because when you reach error, what is error? Failure, you're stuck there. This is a dead end. And that, that's a cool thing, because then you see your machine, and even, even going to your product, you can identify these problems that you have. Here we will need something so the machine can recover, right? Can compensate what happened. In the same way, in success, when you go to success, you can fetch again. If I remove this event from here, it won't fetch another time. You will get stuck in that state. That's important. That's the tiny thing, thingy part. So another thing that's really cool is that your machine is basically back free because you can control all different states. Imagine now in here, uh, I'm doing this throw error in here because I did this with an old React version. I honestly didn't want it to upgrade it. Uh, but now you have the component did catch. And then on this component did catch with in, in new React versions is basically if anything fails inside my component, it, it doesn't matter at what level of the children. Uh, just go to that function and then handle the error. Then you can use that like as the error exit for all your fi different fine machines because you're going to mess them and, and handling there what's going to happen. So if I do this, I think it's going to break. Uh, yeah, something went wrong. So you're moving like safely and in a very like easy to uh, understand way to all the different places of your application. There is no high cyclomatic complexity, and it's predictable what's going to happen. Another cool stuff, now we're going to move to the two things that I love the most. First of all, is if the fancy machine is completely decoupled. So actually, let's go to the, to the file first. You see I'm rendering stuff in here, like whatever, a test, machine state, and then this render from machine. This pattern, I don't like it, but it's illustrative. So if I'm in idle, I render either component, blah, 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 makes a lot of sense. And these components came from these components. They came from these components, which is basically this file. Why is this important? Because here I'm using, oh, I'm in the environment web. So use all the components for React Web. But if you are, for example, in case React Native, yes, require all the React Native components. And then it's completely the couple, the Feinstein machine, which is your business logic. And it doesn't rely on third parties because it's an automata. That means that your whole business logic flows and interactions are holding that JSON. And you can plug and play whatever adapter you want to. 
you can connect here wherever you want. You don't need to even react for that. So this is super powerful, and this is actually solving one problem that we have in the React React Native community not right now, that is this Nicholas Gallagher project, which is amazing, React Native Web, but they are trying to translate the components. And my hypothesis is that not possible. They are completely, as Kathleen mentioned, they are completely different contexts, and user expects completely different things. You cannot say that a drop down is gonna be a picker in a mobile phone. That doesn't make any sense. But what makes sense is that you have your business logic completely decoupled, and then you have your different storybooks with all your components, and then you just plug and play your fancy machine, and suddenly it works. Okay, you have a contract, that's true, which is that your components share the same names, but they think that's something we can pay. So that's super cool. And then the other part is that, you don't see this, second. So if I do, sorry. No. So if I do this, um, I, I don't know. I think that's gonna work. I'm not sure. Hopefully, it's running. Get in, please. Cool. So we have this almost 70% coverage. Everything's fine, or more or less fine. And whoops, warm window. And this is all of our testing. There is nothing else. That's everything. Absolutely everything. We, I, we only have one eat case. This is doing all the testing for the application. I mentioned the fantasy machine uh, is deterministic. That means that you can predict the different states. So we are doing a really easy approach in here. You should do something a bit more complex, which is transitioning between the different states. But here, what we are doing is just you know, since it's predictable and I don't care about the previous state, I can just start my Feinstein machine in all the different states and then trigger a, trigger a snapshot. Uh, you don't have to believe me, just watch it by yourself. If you're here, this is evil, so we see the, you know, the, the spy guy, find you one button, you're in fetching, you see the eyes, yada yada, and it, you know, everything. If it's an error, you see the, the poop, all, all the stuff. So, it, the, this, I don't know, for me, the, when I realized this thing, for me it was the mind-blowing moment, was the, okay, this is the thing. I don't have to write the test, test can be automatically generated. On top of that thing, you're gonna start. So this thing is a lot of material to do a different topic and write the book. Because on top of that, you can start doing probe-based testing, you can start doing uh, different environments, you can start like doing this, what, what you usually do in the end-to-end -end test, which is like the flows of the user, you can do that with Feinstein machines also, and you don't need to trigger a virtual DOM or a JS DOM or something like that, a Chromeless, a headless Chrome, something like that. This is super powerful. So this is basically, for me, what were like the most awesome benefits as I mentioned, and we saw commands, which are basically the side effects. If you are, uh, came from uh, Michael explained at the beginning, like recent email, they have the built-in concept of side effects, which is really powerful, uh, like really, 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 really powerful. As you mentioned before, that's what made, makes possible that you can decouple your, your business logic completely from your renders or visualizers. Uh, it completely avoids the, pos the option of race conditions because you don't have conditions at all. The only condition that we have in the whole project is the switch case, which technically it's a condition, uh, but whatever, it's a switch case. Like, you cannot really mess up with that. Uh, it's the couple, that, that's what that, that means. The testing can be automatically generated, so it's really powerful and you don't lose more time. Also, which I think it's important, but it's really on the math part, but this really, uh, how to say, validates that your testing are worth it. Because when you're doing manual testing, it really depends on, the, on, on your part, that you have to do the testing good. You can, you can go to your test suite and write, expect one to be one, and no one's gonna complain, apart from other developers, right? But the machine is gonna say, yeah, perfect. You got it, man, go for it. Uh, it's gonna work, right? But now it's automatically generated based on your project, based on your fantasy machine. So if it works, it works. It's guaranteed by the system, which is mind-blowing experience, right? So uh, this is like a very, very, very small and condensed uh, talk about what are the fantasy machines. 
the idea of this talk is that you see something that say, hey, this is actually a problem that I have, and it's an interesting solution, and you explore a bit on your own. So here are some resources that I think that are really interesting. Not even, so libraries, for example, not even only for use, but maybe you can just go there and see the example, see the code, how it works. Uh, the reads are super interesting. The first one is a very difficult to find book uh, because it's not like in the normal stores or bookshops. And when you find it, usually it's like 100 bucks. So if you manage to get one, even if it's expensive, buy it. And anyway, oh, oh, it's also super important. A lot of people ask me when I present these this kind of things, like for real world examples. Well, VS Code Telemetry, which is the thing that you go to Visual Studio Code and then you share like your session with another fella, wherever in the world, and he can see your screen right at the same time. You can ha write in, in, in them, whatever. This whole thing, it's a fine machine, which is pretty cool. And also the question that I asked at the beginning, does anyone in the audience know what is this picture? Yes, that's it. So uh, basically, uh, yes. So basically, if uh, you want, you are NASA, okay, and you have a multi-billion, trillion, gazillion dollars project, and you want to send a robot to another planet, and you have only one shot, obviously. It's not something that you can just try and fail. You have to pick up one pattern, one architecture, one technology, and all the robots and almost all the things that are in the space, they're fancy machines. This is the proof, don't believe me, believe NASA. This is the proof <laughs> that when you're doing fancy machines, it's a really bug-free system. It's guaranteed that's gonna work. Uh, yeah, Chris this rover. So that's basically it. Uh, remember, I'm an independent contractor, so if you need a hand, just drop me a line. Also, if you are interested in fancy machines, want to know something else, I'm on Twitter, like super always, super available. That's basically it. Thank you.